In the first part of this video, we will introduce the time-independent Schrödinger equation, which describes many simple systems in a stationary state. We start from the general form of the one-dimensional Schrödinger equation. Let's make variables separation by factoring in the wave function as a product of position and time functions. Now the left-hand side of the equation is we divide both members with the product ux vt. Both sides must be equal to a constant, let us denote it w. Let's consider the right side. Multiplying by ux, we get This is the time-independent Schrödinger equation. We can see that this is an eigenvalue equation for the energy operator named the Hamiltonian operator. By solving this equation we may obtain the wave functions and the corresponding values of the energy in a stationary state of a quantum system. The time dependence is obtained immediately by solving the equation from the left-hand side, which must be equal to the same constant. So we obtain the general form of a solution for the wave function. We can see that such a function depends on an eigenvalue of the energy obtained by solving the time-independent Schrödinger equation. As this is a linear differential equation, any linear combination of such function is the solution of the Schrödinger equation. This leads to the fundamental principle of the superposition of quantum states and generates some very important consequences and also some controversial ones. We will discuss in the following the quantum harmonic oscillator, which is a quantum mechanical analog of the previously studied classical harmonic oscillator. It is a very important concept because, as we have already seen, a usual physical system, when slightly displaced from its equilibrium position, experiences a restoring force, F, proportional to the displacement, X, the derivative of the potential with respect to X. This means that the system will oscillate with a well-defined frequency and the motion is described by a sinusoidal function of time. The potential, Vx, may be obtained by solving this differential equation. So we shall use this potential in the time-independent Schrödinger equation. We may see that this is an eigensystem for the energy operator, the Hamiltonian, 
here the wave function is an eigenfunction, while w is the eigenvalue. Now, solving this equation, Mathematica obtains the wave function in terms of parabolic cylindric function, which are not very suitable for a physical interpretation we will try to comply with the usual Copenhagen interpretation of the wave function. The probability density of finding a particle at a given point, when measured, is proportional to the square of the magnitude of the particle's wave function at that point, the Born rule. Of course, this implies that the wave function must be square integrable i.e. the integral of the square of the absolute value is finite, so that the total probability of finding the particle somewhere should be 1. Physically, this means that the magnitude of the wave function must be 0 at infinity, and this condition is difficult to achieve for the parabolic cylindrical terms. However, this condition could be achieved more easily if the wave function would contain a Gauss exponential factor, as Sommerfeld suggested. We may try to suggest this to Mathematica also, by explicitly writing such a factorization, and by magic the solution appears in a more familiar form, a Hermite polynomial term, and a hypergeometric one. Hermite polynomials were already well known in mathematics and are known to be absolutely integrable if the first argument is a natural number n. You can find this proof in many mathematical treatises using the decomposition into series of power and uh, establishing a recurring relationship between the terms of the equation. Let's use some numerical values and verify the two terms of the solution. We can see that the integral of the first square terms is indeed finite. In fact, from mathematics, it is known that the squared norm of the Hermite polynomial is 2 to n, n factorial, the square root of pi. So we can use this as a normalization constant so that the total probability is 1. On the other hand, the second term is not square integrable, so it is not physically acceptable. Assembling the usable factors, we may conclude that the wave function is
provided that the first argument of the Hermite polynomial is a natural number, we can deduce the eigenvalues of energy. This is our first result that demonstrates the quantification of energy in the case of microparticles. We notice that the energy cannot have any values, but only some quantified in steps of h omega. Moreover, it can be seen that the minimum value of energy, unlike the classical case, is not zero, but half h omega. It should be noted that the size of the step obtained here, h omega, is not a demonstration of the Planck-Einstein relationship, because in fact this relationship was the starting point. The result obtained is in fact a first prediction of quantum mechanics for the energy values of the quantum harmonic oscillator. Let's use some numerical values and make a graphical representation of the energy levels. With consecutive values of n, we will draw horizontal lines of the corresponding height above the abscissa. We will append these lines to a graphical object, which is initially null, then we will show it. We take care to clear the value of n so that we may use this symbol further analytically. We may see that uh, the energy is indeed quantized, forming a discrete spectrum on the fundamental state with n equals zero has non-zero energy, half h omega. Let's also make a graphical representation of the wave function for various values of n. These are the normalized eigenfunctions of the Hamiltonian for the quantum harmonic oscillator, a product from Gauss functions on Hermite polynomials. Now let's try to compare the probability density function of quantum particle with the probability density function of a classical particle that performs harmonic oscillations. In the classical case, the probability that the particle will be in a segment dx is equal to the fraction of time dt while it is in that segment related to the time it travels the entire trajectory in one direction, i.e. a half period t over 2. Taking into account that dx to dt is the speed of the particle, we may write We can calculate the particle speed from the condition that the total energy as a sum of the potential energy and the kinetic energy is constant. Now, if we want to make an analogy, we must use the same energy for the quantum and classical case. Hence, the classical probability density function results as 
we may simplify it further. In the quantum case, we already know that the probability density function is the square of the magnitude of the particle's wave function. We calculated the wave function in terms of our might polynomials, so we have Let's use some numerical values and make a graphical representation of the probability density function. First, for the quantum case, we obtain Now let's also show the classical probability density function. We may see that the classical distribution, green, is somehow an average of the quantum distribution, blue. From the classical probability density function formula, we can see that it has two vertical asymptotes. Let's show them too. Now let's try to interpret this graphical representation. The classical particle moves in a limited area, the probability density having two vertical asymptotes that delimit the classical forbidden regions. However, the quantum particle has a non-zero probability of penetration in the classical forbidden regions. This behavior, called the tunnel effect, which will be studied in more detail in the following videos, has remarkable technological application and underlies the operation of current non-volatile memories and many high-frequency devices. I hope that so far it is not too difficult to agree with quantum mechanics, although it is not difficult for you to reveal some very interesting questions about it. Maybe in some future videos we'll try to address some of them. Maybe we too will agree that the deeper we learn quantum mechanics, the lesser we understand it. After all, there are intelligent people that still wonder how the Australians don't fall down, although for some of us it is easy to understand it.